Okay. Um, so I'll just, uh, I'll begin so we can stay on time. So I just want to talk a little bit about uh, the economics of climate change from an Indian perspective. So I, I, I'll begin by just showing you these graphs, which I'm sure most people are familiar with. Uh, the issue, the problem is just is driven primarily by CO2 concentrations, although of course there are also other greenhouse gases um, which contribute uh, considerable amounts. Um, and that's resulted in this temperature increase that we see uh, over uh, roughly the last century or so. Uh, and as we can see, the, the global mean temperature has risen by about a degree or so compared to a century ago. Um, and it's somewhat less over land uh, and over India in particular. So let me go on to uh, talk about economic impacts that we have seen in India uh, so far. Um, so, uh, so I'll talk about crop impacts first. Uh, so the major crops have been impacted uh, because India being a tropical country is already at, uh, it's a region of the world in which we're already at the, tend to be at the higher limits of what's optimal uh, for growing these various crops. Uh, so for example, wheat, which is grown in India in winter, uh, Northern India in winter, wheat is uh, about estimated to be about 5% lower than they would have been if the temperature hadn't increased uh, in the period of the 80s to uh, 2009. Um, so I think it's important to recognize that wheat yields have been growing. I mean, they grew by a factor of about 2.5 over this period, uh, thanks to technical progress. Um, but, um, but relative to what they would have been, they're lower. So um, rice production is also a few percentage points lower than it would have been. That's a uh, paper by uh, Alf Hammer, Ramanathan and Vincent, uh, which is now fairly old. And there've been more studies along these lines, which show pretty much the same thing. In the non-agricultural sector, we find that uh, heat stress uh, has an effect on labor productivity, and that has resulted in a fall in manufacturing output which is of the order of about 2% per degree rise in temperature. There have been um, other impacts. Uh, for example, there's been a threefold rise in extreme rain events over central India, and these are associated with damages from flooding. Um, there's also been reduced total rainfall in the same period. That's for central India. And there have been increased heat waves uh, and associated mortality. So these impacts are not negligible, uh, but they're not huge either. They're about the order of one or two percent of GDP. Uh, and the important thing is this: that if these impacts are maintained at these levels of you know small you know, one or two percentage points of GDP, and GDP can grows um, the way it has been doing in the past, although we've had a growth slowdown uh, in the last few years, but uh, GDP continues to grow at you know, seven, eight, nine percent uh, as it did in the early 2000s. Uh, then, you know, we can see very large increases in GDP and there'll be a small decline in the level as a result of climate change. So, uh, although that's regrettable, it's not disastrous, right? But that's if, uh, impacts continue to be at this level. But there's another issue which uh, is quite important in India, which is that these impacts tend to fall more heavily on the poor who are generally more vulnerable. Right? There are fewer safety nets and fewer uh, resources to cope with, that, with negative shocks. So uh, one long run impact of this is that agricultural productivity losses tend to raise food prices um, because of course food supply is reduced. And the poor spend a greater share of the income on food than the rich. 
So as a result, uh, losses to the poor in percentage terms are about three to six times greater than the first order impact of GDP, depending on whether, depending on how open the Indian economy is to trade or not. So it's, it's, um, if it's more important to trade, uh, more open to trade, then um, then the, the, the losses are, um, are significantly mitigated, essentially because India just imports more food uh, and exports uh, more manufactures and services. Um, and also, of course, the faster the economy grows, uh, then the smaller this effect because the economy gets richer and this effect of the poor consuming a large share of the budget on food gets smaller. Um, so those are so so far I've been talking primarily about impacts that we have already observed, uh, but uh, much greater impacts are yet to come. Right, we know that because the temperature is going to continue to go up. Um, so one of the issues uh, which is um, of major concern to India is glacier and snowpack melt in the Himalayas, and that will reduce dry season water supply in the north. Um, so under RCP 8.5, uh, which is one of the scenarios of the IPCC, uh, it's been estimated uh, that 50 to 70 percent of glacier mass uh, will, might be lost by 2050. So here's uh, a graph from a report uh, that came out recently. If you look at uh, some of these, also by relevant to China, by the way. Uh, but if you look at panels I, M, and N uh, in the second last row and the bottom row, so those are the ones which are relevant for India, the West Himalaya, the Central Himalaya, and the East Himalaya. You see uh, these are the predictions uh, for going from uh, 2000 to 2050 to 2100 of the, the amount of mass that's estimated to remain uh, in these glaciers and these regions. And what you can see is that even by 2050, uh, under the under RCP 8.5, which is the red one, uh, you're getting a mass loss in, exists in excess of 50%. Right? Uh, and by the end of the century, it's, uh, it's much, much worse. Right? Uh, and there's a considerable difference between uh, the scenario uh, with, uh, that keeps you within a uh, likely chance of achieving a one and a half degree uh, Celsius target as, it, as compared to uh, the one uh, 8.5, 8 which of course will take us to three, four degrees. Okay, um, so that's one major looming threat. Another one, which is very serious for India, uh, is uh, sea level rise. Uh, and so there's been uh, there was some, uh, there's been some papers recently which essentially updated elevation information uh, around the world. Uh, and these updated elevation estimates produced news that wasn't good. So this is uh, Bombay, Mumbai. Uh, and you can see that the, the city center essentially under these new elevation estimates is expected to be below the high tide line. Uh, by 2050, right, uh, for most of the city. So that's really uh, uh, that's really an enormously scary consequence. 2050 is only 30 years away, uh, and if this if these estimates are correct, and uh, and I want to say that all these projections are based on models and assumptions of various kinds, um, and so there could be uh, errors in them, right? Uh, things might actually not be so bad as estimated here. On the other hand, they could be worse. Uh, we don't really know until it actually works out. Anyway, but this is uh, the best available estimate at the moment. And it, what it shows is, uh, is really frightening because we are seeing millions of people uh, and the commercial hub, one of the major commercial hubs in India, most of it is going to go uh, underwater. Uh, well. That's not literally underwater, perhaps, but underwater when uh, the tide is high. Uh, you can see this is the same source. Um, and you can see that in Eastern India also, there's a huge, there's going to be a huge problem. Uh, you can see that uh, Kolkata, 
is in the, the, the middle of, over there. It's in the edge of that red zone. So substantial parts of uh, Kolkata also uh, will be under uh, sea level at high tide. Uh, and large parts of uh, you know West Bank, Odisha, West Bengal, and huge parts of Bangladesh. Uh, so one can imagine uh, this is by 2050, uh, which is really not that far away. Uh, so uh, one can imagine the kinds of effects that this is going to have. Um, and what is uh, also a matter of really great concern is that you know this is if this is correct and um, then we're going to see a lot of impacts long before 2050 because there are going to be storm surges, which means that that you know um, these places will get flooded uh, much more often uh, than they do now. Okay, so the other uh, the the direct consequence of warming um, on India is also quite is likely to be uh, very severe. All right, and again, it's because we are already we tend to, we are in a temperature range, which is already at the high end of what people inhabit uh, and what people have historically inhabited uh, in the last six thousand years. Okay, so uh, if you look at this map, uh, what you see is that uh, black areas have a mean annual temperature greater than twenty nine degrees Celsius today. All right, and that's basically to the Sahara where you know, all the other deserts where nobody lives essentially or very few people. But you see that this, uh, that this band of uh, mean annual temperature greater than 29 degrees essentially spreads to uh, encompass a large swathe of the tropics in South America, Africa, Arabia, um, South Asia, and Southeast Asia, right? Uh, so this is again likely to create, is likely to mean that all of these issues that I raised, which have already been observed, are going to be magnified greatly. So it's going to, uh, we might have quite severe cascading consequences. That's really the worry. So if these impacts remain confined to just, you know, somewhat larger version of what we've already seen, uh, then we can adapt them, right? The problem is that that they might not, right? We could have, you know, a series of disasters, uh, and these can trigger migration, in particular, uh, large-scale migrations, uh, which tend to uh, go with political instability and conflict. And if those are severe and wide enough, then that can reduce investment and that can reduce economic growth. So the general assumption that we're going to continue growing the way we've been growing in the past, right, the investment climate is going to stay more or less the same, uh, might not hold. Uh, here's some work on uh, um, on the probability of conflict uh, when there are adverse uh, precipitation and temperature events. Uh, so these are, uh, this is a paper that looks at essentially a large number of studies uh, which have been done looking at um, climatic changes. Right? And what we can see is that uh, there are a few studies which find uh, essentially uh, you know, negative or you know, small positive effects uh, which are not statistically distinguishable from no effect. But on the other hand, there are quite a large number of studies which do find, uh, you know, a, an increased likelihood of conflict uh, as a result of uh, these negative climate changes, which is, which is basically temperature increases and precipitation declines. And we can see that, uh, you know, it's quite possible that uh, that we do have historical experience to suggest that these kinds of changes could trigger um, conflict. Okay, so um, it's also clear that emission reductions will not happen sufficiently fast 
to have a realistic chance of staying below a global mean temperature increase of one and a half degrees, and also very likely not below two degrees. So we, we saw uh, in Jing stock, for example, that uh, China, uh, that there's a projection with regard to the power sector that there'll be a peak in emissions, um, but then, uh, you know, a plateau for at least uh, quite a while, right, in which emissions will not come down. Right? Uh, and the kinds of emissions that we, you know, the kind of emission declines that we do need to see in order to reach one and a half degrees are extremely drastic, right? So this is what is projected, uh, you know, these are the kinds of emissions declines that you would have to see uh, if you have a good chance of meeting the one and a half degree target, right? Uh, so one looks at this graph and what's happening so far and what how that has to change, it really seems uh, very, very, very unlikely that it's going to happen. Okay, so that's kind of the bad news. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, it is, it does, it is kind of uh, sort of frightening when one looks at uh, some of these consequences that might uh, yeah, come, come about uh, and it can seem sort of paralyzing. But I don't think uh, we should stop there. Uh, and we have to ask the question, so what can be done to avoid these severe impacts? Because these severe impacts are, are coming, right? We know that things are going to get worse, uh, considerably worse. Well, um, the thing is that India is still, uh, you know, not formally technically a low-income country according to the World Bank definitions, but it's only, you know, slightly above that level, right? Uh, with a per capita GDP of the order of about $2,000 per capita, which is about one sixth of, uh, well, maybe in, in, uh, in PPP terms, uh, you know, third of China's, uh, in nominal terms, uh, one sixth of China's. So uh, clearly the, the the most important priority is rapid economic growth. It's the best productor, the best protector, because it will reduce the number of very vulnerable people uh, and it will raise the resources available to cope with increasingly frequent and severe disasters that uh, we know are going to come. Right, but of course, to get this rapid economic growth, um, and historically, I should say that uh, India has had fairly rapid economic growth since. Uh, 1990s and especially the 2000s uh, until about uh, you know the last decade or so when growth has slowed uh, but even with that slower growth it's you know four or five percent uh, which is not that bad but it is you know uh, much slower than China's and that's the reason that China China has been growing about four or five percent faster than India uh, every year for the last uh, three four decades. Uh, more or less, and the result of that uh, is why you know, China is, uh, has a much higher income and therefore is in a much better position to cope uh, with various impacts, in addition, of course, to not being uh, as tropical right, and having a much more temperate climate, especially uh, in the north. Okay, so... Uh, but of course, to just to say that we should have faster economic growth, uh, well, everybody's trying to achieve that anyway, and it's not easy. Uh, we are in a bad political equilibrium in which elected officials at central, state, and local levels don't have enough of an incentive. They do have some, but they don't have enough of an incentive to take growth enhancing actions. And that's why we've had uh, sort of middling growth uh, experience rather than uh, you know, very high growth experience. There may be ways out of this trap, but that's a subject for another day. So let me go on to uh, show you uh, essentially what the distribution over countries is of emissions. So on the horizontal axis here, we have um, GDP per capita uh, in uh, adjusted for purchasing power parity. And on the, and the vertical axis, we have uh, 
the percent of global CO2 emissions by, by all countries up to that level of uh, GDP, right? So it's sort of cumulative percent of emissions. Um, and what you see, what stands out at, in this graph is that essentially low-income countries are basically negligible in terms of global emissions. They account for something like 1% or less of global emissions. That's those flat dots in the bottom left. Then you see a jump, uh, and that's India, right? Because we're a large country, we account for about 7% of global emissions. Um, and then you have some other lower middle income countries which are richer than India that gets you uh, to somewhat higher percentage. If you take all lower income and lower middle income countries together, they account for less than 25% of uh, global emissions. And so that you can see read off the, the graph here. Then you get to higher income, which is basically upper middle income countries. And you can see that this thing jumps again. Uh, that's because China, of course, is a huge economy and has the largest uh, CO2 emissions in the world, about a quarter or so, uh, somewhat more than a quarter of, uh, of world uh, emissions. Right, And then you get to the uh, high income countries, which together account for more than a third of global emissions. I just want to say that, you know, uh, I already made this graph with World Bank data, and there are a few missing countries in these data. So the percentages are not exactly accurate uh, because of that, uh, but they're roughly roughly correct. Uh, and the US and China together account for close to 40% of global emissions. Okay, uh, so the point to take away from this is that from the Indian perspective, uh, 7% of global emissions isn't a lot, right? We can reduce emissions uh, a great deal, uh, but that's only going to address 7% of the problem, right? Uh, so 7% is not nothing. Uh, and it's also true that experience so far suggests that countries tend to strengthen their emission reduction policies in response to other countries doing so. And there are a number of reasons for that. It's partly because increasing the market for fossil free, free technologies such as renewables and storage helps them move down the learning curve that reduces costs and that makes them more attractive to everybody. Although this learning effect tends to happen partly uh, within countries uh, because of local supply chains being built um, and local financing uh, being, you know, de-risking of finance within country. Uh, but there's also, of course, global spillovers, right? And uh, Chinese manufacturing, for example, has been a big contributor to these learning curves, uh, you know, increasing production for solar panels and wind turbines, which have brought their cost down. Uh, so that's one economic reason why, uh, why emission reductions in one country seem to be triggering emission reductions in other countries. That's the, seems to be the historical experience over the last few decades. Um, it's also because country, other countries sort of observe, you know, that other countries have reduced emissions considerably and that this hasn't hurt their economies noticeably, right? I think, uh, for example, um, the European experience has been quite important in uh, dispelling some of the fears that emission reduction policies would have negative effects, serious negative effects on the economy. Um, okay, so so that's one. So there are positive externalities uh, to other countries from emission reduction, and that's one reason that India should do it, even though uh, we have, uh, you know, we don't account for a very large share of emissions. Um, of course, uh, you know, our major priority is, has to be to uh, improve economic growth and development. Now, oh, is it possible to do both? Uh, well, we've had a spectacular, uh, spectacularly successful set of policies that have resulted in solar PV and wind power costs that are among the lowest in the world. Uh, and this, these have been dri primarily driven by using auctions to procure renewable power that grew supply chains, found cheap finance, 
uh, and drove down costs. So uh, we have been extremely successful, uh, at least at utility scale renewable technologies, uh, much, much less so at uh, decentralized uh, distributed solar. Uh, anyway, the effects of these policies together with you know, the global decline in costs uh, driven by uh, an expansion in manufacturing primarily in China has been that we have these fairly low renewable costs, right? So here, um, here's a graph which shows you on the left-hand side, private costs, on the right-hand side, uh, social costs, which include externalities, uh, both of renewables and of coal-fired power. So in India, you know, most of our electricity, about uh, three quarters of our electricity comes from coal, right? So it's heavily uh, emission intensive. Uh, and reducing that's going to be important. Also, the power sector is the largest emitter uh, of any sector in India. So, if you look at uh, so what what here again, these graphs are basically looking at coal capacity, uh, you know, in, in, arranged in order of increasing cost from left to right. Look at the, the the panel on the right, which are the social costs, and what you see is that the red line is essentially just the cost of uh, it's just the cost of operating plants. And you can see that a uh, you know, large fraction of coal capacity has costs which are higher than the cost of new renewables. Uh, and this is taking into account the externalities that renewables impose on the grid, right? Balancing costs and so on. Uh, and you can see uh, therefore that we are already in a situation in which it's cheaper to build new renewables than to continue to operate many of our existing coal plants. Right? Uh, this, the difference, you know, in the coal costs between the left and the right panels is primarily driven by air pollution, uh, mortality effects of air pollution. Air pollution kills a lot of people. Uh, and uh, that's the reason that the social costs are higher than the private costs in the case of coal. But the economic implication is that it is both growth enhancing and emission reducing uh, to substitute a uh, good, good fraction of the coal power sector with renewables already, right? And that was in 20, these are for 2018 costs. Uh, in the same paper, we also uh, you know, did some projections uh, for different electricity generation technologies, taking into account these learning curve effects that we're observing. Um, and what we see is that by 2025, uh, we are going to see costs of various renewable technologies with storage, right? Which is the major concern with expanding renewable generation uh, is its dispatchable, its lack of dispatchability, right? But we see that the cost of storage are also coming down. And uh, so this projection suggests that uh, by 2025, you're uh, going to be roughly in the same uh, same cost range as building, you know, it would be as cheap to build renewables with storage roughly as it would be to build new coal plants, right? Uh, so, so that suggests that actually it's economically it's economically sensible for India to pursue uh, a rapid transition out of coal uh, in the power sector. Okay, so what are the various actions or policies, roughly speaking? Uh, well, we want to replace coal with renewables of our generation, not all at once, obviously, uh, but uh, we need to go move in that direction and we can afford to do so quite aggressively. Uh, so there is already a tax on coal in India. It's about 400 rupees a ton, um, which is equivalent to about like three and a half dollars per ton of CO2, uh, roughly speaking. Uh, so we should essentially raise that coal tax gradually uh, in order to provide a signal to the market uh, to shift the direction of its investments. We also need to upgrade our transport sector by decongesting roads, uh, both uh, highways as well as uh, local roads. Uh, so we need to use congestion pricing, which hasn't been done uh, so far. Uh, 
uh, need to upgrade railways, uh, need to increase uh, public transport. All of these will be both growth and growth enhancing and emission reducing. Uh, similarly, uh, there, there are hardly any energy efficiency standards for buildings in India. Uh, those, need, those need to go into effect. Um, and we need to strengthen energy efficiency standards for appliances that we already have. Uh, and we need to reform electricity pricing in order to send the right signals for uh, electricity conservation. Um, that, of course, has to be done, keeping in mind that uh, that the poor need to have access to electricity, right? Uh, but the way that the subsidies are being delivered now are not uh, at all efficient. So it's possible to essentially deliver subsidies to the subsidized electricity to the poor without, uh, without distorting incentives uh, too much. Uh, which at the moment isn't being done. So that that's going to need some reform of, in uh, the distribute for the, the distribution companies. Um, do you want to ask a question now, uh, Bhaskar? Yeah, I just wanted to tell you that you have a couple of minutes left. Okay. Right. Um, and then in the transport sector, uh, we need to, we should electrify right light vehicles. Uh, this electrification is actually happening in a market driven way with two and three wheelers, uh, especially three wheelers, uh, already about 30 to 40% of three wheeler production in India is electric, uh, essentially because that's the cheapest option now. Um, and uh, we need to maintain our fuel taxes at a high level, which is always, a, you know, there's always some politics around that. Um, so, Apart from trying to grow faster and doing what little emission reduction we can, what else can we do to protect ourselves? Uh, given that we face these fairly serious, uh, very serious dangers ahead. So one of the things that uh, has been at re receiving increasing attention uh, in the policy domain here is uh, geoengineering. Uh, and there's essentially two ways to do it. One is carbon dioxide removal. Uh, so you suck carbon dioxide out of the air, either chemically using non-fossil energy. Uh, there are technologies that exist, but they're expensive. Uh, or biologically, by increasing forest cover or growing algae in the oceans. Um, of course, there's limited land available to do that. Uh, there are all kinds of problems uh, with tampering with the oceans. And of course, there's this the huge scale of the problem, which is the major factor. Right, is basically you want to run the entire industrial revolution and everything after uh, in reverse, right? So you can imagine that's not going to be uh, an easy thing to do. And the point is that it'll probably take centuries uh, to sort of get back down to a safe level of CO2, even assuming that we're going to see rapid technological change if, uh, if uh, sequestration is incentivized with uh, market incentives. So it's too slow given the speed with which disasters can, can cascade. What we're talking about is decades uh, and this would take centuries. The other way is albedo enhancement or what's called solar radiation management, which basically is uh, increased reflectance so that less solar radiation enters. And if it's successful, it would reduce the temperature and can be done on a time scale of decades. Um, but of course it would do nothing about the CO2 concentration uh, which also acidifies the oceans and threatens marine ecosystems and food chains. So, so it's not a it's not a cure all. Uh, one of one technology which has been proven in terms of its cooling effect is to inject millions of tons of sulfate aerosols every year into the upper atmosphere from aircraft, and it's been estimated that this cost only in the order only of the order of tens of billion dollars. Uh, per year, which is less than 0.1% of, one, one, uh, of world GDP. The problem is that it's very risky, right? So there are side effects. It might deplete the ozone layer and lead to unpredictable changes in climate, such as droughts. In particular, the Indian monsoon could be severely weakened, which is what some of the literature suggests. But we have to take into account the fact that we don't, we don't have any good choices here. So everything, doing nothing is dangerous. Doing something is also dangerous. So I think it's really important uh, 
that we do invest in creating the capacity to ramp up geoengineering quickly if we get to the point that the, not, the risk of not doing it becomes unacceptable. Uh, so and I think that we are going to get there in the next few years. Uh, so we should probably start doing the research uh, right now. Uh, so that's, uh, I think, something very important, which is really not very much out there in the policy debate so far. Uh, it And doing the research could also help find ways to avoid dangerous side effects, such as ozone loss and monsoon weakening. Uh, there are, there's also a strategic uh, aspect of geoengineering, right? Countries are asymmetrically situated with respect to the risks from unabated global warming. As a first approximation, tropical poor countries like India are in greater danger in the near term than rich temperate countries. If India were to invest in geoengineering capacity and thus signaling a willingness to undertake geoengineering and, the, and a capacity to do so, this could increase the incentive for temperate countries to reduce their emissions. Since if they don't do so, it will make it more likely that under, India will undertake geoengineering with all its attendant risks. This kind of argument has is out there in the literature now. Um, and I think it's something that you know, has to be taken seriously. Although I think that you know the primary reason to do this is basically protective, right? You want to have the capacity to ramp up in case things get bad very quickly. Uh, okay. Uh, and of course, if that does trigger a stronger climate agreement, that would be good for all countries, right? And of course, especially for poor tropical countries. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you.